Hello, this is Chris Nelson for EvolveConsciousness.org. Today I'll be reading the article, the etymological article, Kind, Kin, Genus, and Care. So this was in my Trivium Studies, Metaphysical Studies, because you have kind, and kind relates to... Um, Species, kind, class, sort, variety. So it deals with uh, different types of things. And you have kin, so you have a different kind. Then you have kin from the kind and a genus. So above the species, there's the genus, genus and species. And it also relates to care, I think. Uh, yeah, genus and care relate because genus generating and care generating the generation. So I related these words. And my featured image is an image I made in the Foundational Living and True Unity presentation. And it's the Pyramid of Identification and Connection for Value and Morality. This has to do with our identification with other beings more like us or less like us, and it also deals with uh, the level of our heart center development, our care development, our compassion, empathy, conscience, and morality. And the, the least morality is the most self-centered, and the most morality is the least self-centered. So you can read, you can take a look at that image, or go back to my foundational living and true unity and go through the whole presentation or find where the, the image is talked about in there. The word kind, as in to be kind towards, friendly, etc., is completely related to greater care and inclusion of others into your circle of compassion, empathy, conscience, and morality. The story of being kind, caring, is related to how we view what our kind is. Because you identify with your kind, and then you will be kind, you will have care for your kind, for your type of uh, living body vehicle that you identify with in others, as yourself in a way. So this work developed from an inquiry, questioning, curiosity, doubt on the accurate, accurate use of the word kind what it really means and how people use it, similarly as I have done with other words such as compassion and sympathy. So the reason was because, um, just as I mentioned in the Truth is Love article, we always have these um, fraudulent thinkers and emotionally weak people who attempt to dismiss what you're saying because it's a harsh truth, so they're going to say you're unkind, you're uncompassionate. Um, all these emotionally charged words in a negative context in order to make you feel guilty for what you're doing, when all you're doing is speaking the truth, which is uh, a result of the expansive force of consciousness, which is love and truth in the sense of caring. Truth is caring. Having a care for truth and morality, when you speak the truth, it's to care for truth, and it is also to care for other people, to have them accept the truth. So truth is love, love is truth. And I say here, skip to the explanation to read what the etymological story is telling us. Because I have the words in the etymology, and I, I boldened, emboldened some key words in uh, black. So kind, we have friendly, doing good, natural, native, innate. That comes from jessind, gesind. So kind comes from gesind, or gesind. Natural, native, innate. So a feeling of relatives for each other. So your kind, as you, you view them as relatives, as relatives, or in a sense, your family from the Proto-Indo-European Kunjam, or Kundi, uh, natural and native. So it's natural and native to you. It's your, your family, your kind. So 
So that's why I also say um, the real family, you know, you have your blood family, but that's from a physical basis of uh, genetics and blood relation, but you can have, and we're, we're most attached to our family because they're the ones in our lives the most, we have the most identification, they're the ones who form us, who create us into who we are the most, along with society and school and everything. But our parents from an early age are the ones who develop our ego personality identity construct through reinforcements and of the positive and negative nature. So our, our real family, the one we have natu or natural and native to, apart from the physical sense and the genetic sense, is um, the family of truth. Because that's what our true nature is. Our, the human nature is the true self in a, an alignment with the transcendental aspects of being, of truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, etc. So that was the kind adjective, and we have the kind noun, which is more, as I was referring to in the, the metaphysical sense, as a class, sort, or variety, and that's from the Old English, gesind, again, the same word as above for natural, native, and innate. This time there's no e at the end. So it's just kind, nature, and race. But it's still... Um, in the metaphysics, it's the, the species class, and then you have, well, you can keep looping it, I guess, into the species and genera. That's where we, it's a guess in, we're going to see the, the root coming up. And it's related to sin, which is family, or kind. Uh, yeah, kind, sorry. It's, uh, so the, the, the first kind adjective, it's gekind. I was saying the C as an S, but it's okay because of kind. So it's gekind. And, um, and then kind, C Y N N family. Um, for, from the Proto-Germanic Kunjaz, family race. And from the Proto-Indo-European gene, to give birth, beget. So here we have gene, generate, and we can see it's related to kind. And we'll also see later how it's related to care. So gene, also related to genus. So since we're talking about a species, kind nature, class, sort, variety, in metaphysics, you have the species genera loop, so it can keep going in universals um, as far as you can get in your inspection of what lays behind things. Eventually, you reach a, an end, so it doesn't go on forever, but it is a, a loop where the previous species becomes the next genera for the next species, etc. And just to correct when I said um, for the kind adjective, Kunjam and Kundi, I said Proto-Indo-European, it was actually Proto-Germanic. Sorry about that. So we get to kin, and we have kin, again, same thing as kind, um, C-Y-N-N. -N. It's a family, race, kind, sort, rank, nature, gender, sex. Now we have some cognates with um, kun. In Dutch, which is sex or gender, uh, Gothic Kuni race, Norse Kundar son. Anyways, from the gene, Proto-Indo-European gene to produce again. So they're all from gene. And then we have genus again, kind class thing, race stock, family, birth, descent, origin, birth, offspring, produce, beget. That's from the root Proto-Indo-European gene to produce, give birth, beget. And we have cognates of uh, Sanskrit, uh, Janati, begets bears, uh, Jana, race. So for people like uh, my friend Jana, well, you can see how maybe the origin of her name comes from genus and producing and begetting. So, but this is from Sanskrit, and you know, languages change and things change, but just interesting. And you have uh, origin. Born, become, happy, inborn, character, kinsman. This is all in uh, create, beget. These are all in uh, the cognates for the word genus. As you can see how they relate. All the words I'm talking about so far, they all relate. Kind, kin, genus. All has to do with things that are born. And uh, even inborn character. So there's different ways of thing to be born. There's nasi uh, to be born, and that relates also to knowledge, which all 
I get into into later etymological work. So it's all all my etymological work. They all seem to tie in in some way. And it's like degrees of separation, but you can find etymological roots that tie in. So we have the GE prefix, and that's an association or similarity, a result or process. And then we have the GA prefix, which is an association or togetherness, uh, completeness or wholeness. Now we get to care, sorrow, anxi anxiety or grief, burdens of mind, serious mental attention, uh, wail, lament in uh, the cognates, uh, another cognate is trouble, you have kara, caro, uh, chara, um, and that comes from the Proto-Indo-European -Euro gar, to cry out, call, scream, so I guess it's a, uh, when you care for something, it's a, there's a call or scream, a crying out, a yearning from within, something hurts, as I talked about in the bearing good and evil, I think it was that one, yes it was, where I'm talking about hurt and passion and how they relate as a, as a desire, well, cry out, call, scream. You can see how maybe it relates as a, you know, there's a trouble, a wailing, a lamenting, a sorrow, anxiety, grief, but it moves us um, to do something. We have serious mental attention, a burden of the mind, and we, we act on that burden. A burden of the, quote, heart, or a burden of the, quote, mind, or we act on that um, inner consciousness state between the feedback between our thoughts and emotions. It's an inner state of consciousness. You can try to separate the mind and heart aspects, but it's just look at it just as consciousness instead of saying, oh, well, uh, emotions come first, or oh, thoughts come first. Well, I think I can demonstrate how thoughts come first. But anyways, so the meaning of charge, oversight, or protection, you know, to take care of someone, to take in hand is from, um, well, the, Charge, oversight, and protection is from the 1400s, and uh, take care, take in hand, uh, from the 1580s. And we have a close attention, concern or responsibility, worry, maintenance, upkeep, upkeep, treatment of those in need. So it's take in hand, take care, and uh, you worry, concern, so sorrow, anxiety, grief, you see how it all relates. And we also have king, um, which is uh, kining, originally in Old English, which was a king or ruler. So we have kining as a king, and kining was kind, uh, genus, uh, which was in uh, gekind. Gekind was ge, and then kind, and that's why I had the, the ge prefix and the ga prefix. Because in care you have G-A-R, the Proto-Indo-European gar, to cry out, call, or scream. So you have G-A and G-E. And just with the, the two vowel changes, um, you can see how the words are related, which I'll explain more later. Which is right now. Here's the explanation. When first looking at the word kind as an adjective in terms of friendly, doing good, feeling of relatives for each other, we can see that it comes from the word gekind, which means natural, native, innate, kind, nature, race. The prefix ge- dash is used to form nouns or adjectives of association or similarity. So association or similarity, so you, that's what the kind is, right? You're associating your similarity. So you can see how the prefix ge, which is the root for gekind and inkind, you can see how it relates in etymology. The root word has association or similarity, which is what the kind, native, race, your associations, or to form nouns and verbs with the sense of result or process. So when you generate something, when something's born, well, there's the resulting process, right? The, there's a result, there's a process that culminates in something being born. The adjective kind comes from the same source, the noun kind, from kin. And further, kin comes from gene, hyphen. 
So the G-E-N-E, -E, the Proto-Indo-European gene, the base for genus and generation, from where we get the words genus, generate, etc. Kind, as a noun, is related to class, sort, variety, nature, race. So we have kind as a noun related to genus and generate. And we have... Uh, Uh, sorry, that was kind as an adjective, and we have kind as a noun relating to class, sort, variety, nature, race, family. But even that, kind as an adjective, something that's generated, is still kind as a noun, which is a, a, a race or family, a variety. Varieties are still all generated differently from each other. So there's always generation involved in the root. Genus, which comes from gene as well, means kind or class. Kind and genus mean the same thing. Why? Because they have the same word, because they are the same word initially. Kin is the same as jin or gen. And as I mentioned in an, another audio in passing, in relation to philology, I don't remember which audio I mentioned it in, K and G are interchangeable across languages because they have the same philological derivation in our throat's mouths, the same origin in vocalization. You see, it's a guttural sound. Do it. You can You can test it yourself. The G and the K are uh, they're, they're like uh, g k g k. It's uh, deeper in the the back of the the top of the throat or the back of the mouth. And I've also mentioned other. Uh, words like L and R, because they're both rolling on the tongue, and that's why they've been transposed throughout different languages in history. This is part of philology in uh, language. So, yes, I do know quite a bit on language. I'm not an expert, but I know a lot more than m most people in the world on, on languages and things. Uh, this information I got mostly from... Um, well, my first year in, in the awakening of truth and care for truth to, on the on the journey. At the time, I called it a knowledge quest. Now I understand it as, uh, you know, the quote spiritual um, journey and quest on the path to greater attainment of truth. Same thing. And I got it from uh, reading John Marco Allegro's book on the sacred mushroom and the cross, where he initially talks about. Some origins of words, uh, well, origins of of human history, and how we developed some aspects, and how languages use different letters, but they have the same. You can use them interchangeably. Anyways, interesting book if you want to read it. Other letters have similar relations. All vowels can es essentially be replaced by any other vowel to possibly link words from different languages. And this is a known in the past, even if you go to Egyptian, Hebrew, the older Hebrew that comes from the Egyptian. Um, older languages like these didn't have vowels. They, they were introduced or they were, they had to be contextually derived from what was being said. So you have the Neteru, well that was uh, only Neter. I don't think there were vowels. Usually it's it's done without a vowel. Even have the words ru, it was RW, not RU, even though it's pronounced RU, which is the recent work I'm working on on Egypt and natural law symbolism. Anyways, to continue. Kind comes from gekind from gene. Gekind is redundant in the use of letters because G E and C Y N are used to mean the same thing. So G, genus, and kind. Well, kind comes back to genus anyway, so get kind is, is redundant. The former is a prefix while the latter is actually a word. So G is a prefix, and then kind, well, that was the actual word, kind, and kin. But they point to the same relationship in reality of association and similarity from a resulting process. So from kind, the adjective, we see the relation to greater care. If we go back to kind as an adjective, feeling of relatives for each other, you know, doing good, friendly, family. So yeah, you're going to care 
about those you're friendly to and doing think kind things towards, you're going to have care towards them. So that kind as an adjective is related to greater care. And that's why I have the pyramid of identification and connection for value and morality, because it is based on care. It is based on our ability to recognize our kind or our genus. If you want to go from the species general loop, well, kind and genus are pretty much interchangeable. So where's the where's the bottom of the, the genus? Where's the bottom of our kind? Where's the base of our kind? Well, that's the animal kind. And that's where we all have to get to, to get to the proper level of care. So that we don't create evil and immorality to those of our kind, of our genus, the animal kinds. The closest, most identified kindness, the friendliness, doing good to others, feelings of relatives for each other, is that of our direct blood relations, most specifically our offspring. Family is the first identifier for reciprocal benefit in survival and attempt to live in harmony. You don't harm your family or those you live with because they will endanger your own survival. To harm another you care for is to harm yourself. Tracing etymology is similar to tracing root causal sources of problems to their foundation or of tracing historical roots of probable occurrences to the most logical source. We can also trace a correspondence from the closer genera universals to deeper genera universals, finding greater expansive encompassing genera that enclose more of the many into a greater encompassing unity. So you want to go higher in your genera of your kind, and then you'll be able to encompass more of your genera, the same genus, and more and, and a greater encompassing unity, rather than seeing them as separate or as undeserving of your care, and you can do whatever you want to them and harm them because they're not like you, because you don't have a developed heart center, because you don't have a developed care, conscience, morality, compassion, and empathy. people who don't understand how this works, you know, maybe this article is going to help them because they'll see how in etymology the words reflect our reality. So you want to learn about yourself? Well, learn about words and learn about how they reflect reality and then you'll understand more about reality. From the immediate identification and connection to our close family, there is the larger family, the clan. So now I am um, basically reading the the layers of the pyramid of identification and connection for value and morality. Next is the community, the tribe, then the village, the race, the province, the state, the country, the nation, and then all of human beings. There are different levels of universal genera identification. A kind is a genera, a universal. As we go up universals towards larger encompassing groupings, we can develop our heart center, care, compassion, empathy, conscience, and morality. Care and kindness can expand beyond the family only, tribe only, nation only, race only, and humanity only. Care and kindness can expand towards the next universal kind and genera we belong to, which is all animals. We animals all share feelings and thinking in being and existing, but to different degrees and levels. We can expand care from humans to animals, to all of the universe in some way, where we realize that uh, we don't have the right to just exploit and dominate you know, the whole planet, just because it's not an animal, where we still don't have the right to take whatever we want and do whatever we want with it, because it, it's part of selfishness and self-centeredness, and even though it, you know, it's, it's different from animals, and there you know, might be a rock or whatever, you can't just go mining the whole planet or taking whatever you want and creating destruction and domination. Care is also related to kind and genus, generate, from GE. So GE, the Proto-Indo-European GE hyphen, genus, kin, and then kin with a Y, and then kin with a C-Y-N is about a similarity and association. We associate particular individual substances that share common universal genera. The root of genus, gene, itself goes beyond this and is about the generation itself 
not just the similarity of what is generated within substances. So you have the GE, but then you have GENE. So it, when you add the NE, it adds a bit more. So rather than just the GE prefix of similarity and association, when you do gene, it's about the actual generation, not just the similarity of what is generated within a substance. Because the generation within a substance, you can have several things that have the um, accidental property of green, the quality of green. So that's been generated in them. So there's a similarity and association between kinds, and you can make associations that way with things within them. But a gene is more the generation itself. So generation itself produces a result from a process, which was the uh, other part of the word. We'll go back up. Yeah, for nouns. Because you have forming nouns and adjectives relating to association or similarity, which would be kind. And then nouns and verbs with the sense of result or process, which would be generation and generating. It's all contained in our language. So generation itself produces a result from a process, the process which has a beginning of generation and goes towards some end. Care is from uh, Proto-Indo-European root gar. The etymology for kind as an adjective even shows the root relation to the prefix ga. So ga ga hyphen, or asterisk ga hyphen in Proto-Indo-European, indicates an association, togetherness, completeness, or wholeness. So you see GE, similarity, association, uh, a result in process. Well, GA is an association, togetherness, completeness, or wholeness. So they relate, just as GE does as well. GE has the additional sense of result and process, which is what generation is about. So that's why you have generation and generating has result in process, but the GA doesn't say that specifically. But it does say completeness and wholeness, which I said the result in process has a beginning of generation that goes towards some end. It generates something. So when something is generated, it has a completeness or wholeness. It's together. It's associated in one unit. So when we are generated, uh, when an animal life is generated, well, there's a one individuated unit, and it's complete and whole. Uh, you can't chop an animal in half and it'll keep living. That won't happen. You can't chop a finger and regrow a human. You can do that with a plant, because a plant is not an animal. All right? Plants are not animals. Get over it. Five kingdoms of life do not equate in any way with the last kingdom of life, which is animals. Animals are above all the other five kingdoms of life in terms of complexity and capacity to express consciousness and free will. So GE has the additional sense of result and process, which is what generation is about, a begetting from a process, the result it produces. The process of creating a child results in the birth of a new human being being born in completeness and wholeness. Care is gar from ga, which is related to, uh, from ga, which is related to ge, with an r added, so it is gar, from ga to gar. And as I said before, K and G, and then you can go from C to K, so gar is car, and hence care. So it is gar instead of gene, or kin, with the K or C. Gar is not gene, but they are similar in root meaning. We can see now that care is indeed related to generation, so that we can understand care also in a positive sense, apart from the direct etymological root that are shown as negatives. The negative aspects of, um, in order to care for something, you know, it has to cause sorrow, anxiety, grief, a burden of the mind, a serious mental attention, a wail, a lamenting, trouble. And that de develops into a, a need to, to take charge, to have oversight and protection on something, to take care of, take in hand, and take charge of your life, or do something about some wrong that's going on. So it has a, it's a negative connotation connotation in the sense that it uh, these are negative things that produce us to do something. So that's why in many other audios and work I've done, I, s I always come back to referring to you need to feel reality in order to have some 
deeper connection in terms of um, disturbances, so the sorrow, the anxiety, the grief, the burden of the mind, uh, concern or responsibility, when you're paying close attention and you worry, well, that comes with um, a thought and uh, f uh, a thought and meaning, which creates a physiological reaction. So reality induces, you have thought and meaning produced from that induction of reality. It produces a physiological reaction. Now, this all happens in an instant. You're not even aware that this is happening, but it all involves thought and meaning. It produces a physiological reaction known as a feeling, and this is your emotion. And it gets processed as an emotion. You think about it, and then you can categorize it as a certain feeling, as a certain mode of feeling. So even though it's a, it's a negative, they are required. That's why we need to feel reality to feel the negative so that we can stop the negative, so that we need to feel evil so that we can stop evil. And if you're in a positivity mask, optimism bias, and all you see is the good, well, you're not going to feel the wrongs, and you're not going to be motivated by the sorrow and the grief and the mental burden and bearing evil. You're not going to be feeling the compassion and the sympathy and the empathy. So this rate relates to that other article, bearing good and evil, on the other etymology. What I'm saying here is care has a positive sense, and that you don't need to look at it from that aspect of um, needing to feel the negative in reality in order to do something about it. It's also uh, the generation, because when you do feel something about reality, well, it generates something in you in order to do something. So that's why people who have deadened heart centers, deadened care, deadened compassion, deadened conscience, deadened morality, they, they're not able to change themselves, to actualize in more degrees of truth and morality because they don't have that care to move them to change, to do something else. So the generation capacity in them to be affected from reality, if you look at my um, uh, circle of life, uh, the trivium, causality, consciousness uh, diagram I made. So when you're affected by reality, that comes in in thought, and then eventually you need to develop the care in order to motivate you and actualize the care with your willpower into an action. So a lot of people can't do this because they, they're not feeling reality. They have deadened um, affective capacities. Because uh, The science of affection deals with uh, emotions, and the science of cognition deals with thinking. So here is a quick word association list. Kind, natural, needed, innate. Kin is race, sort, rank, gender, sex, family. Uh, genus. Race, stock, birth, descent, origin, all spring, uh, beget, whoops, there's an error there, bear, become, happened, create, oh, instead of all spring, because I was doing this with, I guess, my dragon uh, speech recognition software, so I don't have to type for my carpal tunnel issue. Um, not all spring, it's offspring. <laughs> And we have care, sorrow, anxiety, grief, burden, serious attention, lament, trouble, close attention, concern, responsibility, worry, maintenance, upkeep. So positive sense of charge, oversight, protection, take care, take in hand. So you start from the negatives of reality and it brings you to the positive. That's why we need to face the negatives in reality in order to bring positive change. Because if you are in denial of your own shadow, demon, darkness, negative, evil, immorality and wrong within you and also in the world, because you're going to deny it in yourself, and then you're going to project an image of yourself onto the world, which is going to blind you, which has to do with the three-mirror analogy that I made in another audio, which I don't remember which one it was. When you project yourself onto the world, and then you don't see the world as it is, because you're projecting your own blindness of yourself onto the world. Or, you know, there's the other mirror where you, you're blind to the world, and you, you copy the world, and it, you're not looking at yourself, because you're just looking at the world as... Um, as a reflection of yourself. You know, it works the other way, uh, looking at yourself as a reflection of the world or looking at the world as a reflection of yourself. Anyways, if you're, you're blinding yourself in some way, you're going to end up not being able to feel reality and not bring yourself to the positive aspect of changing the negative. Now, so long as you d ignore the negative, the negative persists. You ignore the evil, the evil persists. So you need to face the evil, the negative, to have the sorrow, anxiety, grief, burden, serious attention, lament, trouble, uh, bring close attention to reality, to have the concern, to have the responsibility from that worry in order to develop um, a need to, for maintenance and upkeep. Because when we don't face reality, well, we're not maintaining it, we're not upkeeping it, it's just degenerating into a cesspool of shit. 
So from that negative, it'll bring us to the positive of a taking charge of an oversight to protect, to take care, to take in hand, the treatment of those in need, to have an inclination and have a fondness for. We care for people. Um, you know, there, there's, there's the care in the sense you don't even have to have a negative and you just care for someone. There's no negative going on, but you care for them. So there's, a, you know, there's positive and negative. As I talked about in Bearing Good and Evil, uh, you can look at words in, in a positive context and a negative context and you can derive different meanings from it. So natural, needed, innate, race, sort, rank, stick. Stick might be another error from my dragon, naturally speaking, software. Anyways, birth, origin, bear. What is innate, common, natural, needed, is what is part of us and cannot be separated from us. Right? It's innate, natural, needed. Certain needs we have, we can't separate them. And the most... Well, we have the basic needs of food, water, and uh, shelter for survival. All animals have that, but as higher order beings, one of our deep needs is the, the prime capital in life, and that is truth and morality. And a lot of people don't realize that there's this deep need, this longing to care for truth and morality and embody it as an aspect of our, our human nature, who we are supposed to be. And we have the human condition, which is a conditioning that brings us away from our human nature and the ego personality identity construct of conditioning into the existing social structure that our parents are conditioned in, and they project more inductions into us from that common reality, and then we grow up in a, as a reflection of that reality, as a reflection of our parents, that they reinforce certain positives and negatives, and that's who we become. So that's our our conditioned aspect, but we all share the same one human nature, and that's why it's one in my con in conceptualization. If when you accept the the concept of a prime cause or prime mover, when you analyze causality, there's eventually it's infinitely it goes back infinitely in time until you reach uh, a stopping point, which would be the prime cause or prime mover, first cause, etc. So in that respect, in the transcendental being. Truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, true self, higher self, higher will, source, God, all one, spirit, singularity. That's all one thing. Transcendental being is one thing. And our human nature is one thing. We're all the same human nature. And we all operate the same way. Our psychology is all the same. Our brains are all the same. Everything we have is the same. It's just we're born at different places at different times with different impositions, which create different identities. That's how identity is created, through difference. You can't have different identification without a difference. And the one thing is one thing. It's not a difference. You only get the difference when you manifest in physicality. For us, anyways. I don't know how it works in the other realms and other entities. I don't give a shit. I've said that before. I do not live there. I do not operate in their realities. I do not care what they do. If they're creating evil, that's why I view, according to Richard Wetherill's model, um, his concept was that we're actually at the forefront of evolution. All the other beings are below us because we're the ones who can actually change things and they're stuck and they, they can't change or they're, they're not able to manifest or whatever the, the concept is. If you look at an 11-dimensional model of the universe, the first seven are the seven spiritual, quote, spiritual because they're unseen. And this is where all the lower beings are. And then you get the eighth dimension of time and then the three of space above. And this is all encoded in uh, Egyptian symbolism as well, and that's why you have the seven is important, and the four is important, and together they make the eleven, which is important. And eleven is the justice card. Eleven is the duality of the two paths of good and evil. It's also the cross. It's also the ka. It's also the, quote, spirit, which is the ka, which is the two paths that we choose to walk and either create a heaven and a hell, to either be authentic or inauthentic. Anyways, this is all going to come later in my work. I'm just giving you some previews. And... Yeah, so... I forgot what I was talking about, but now I remember. And I was saying, um, innate, natural, needed in our human nature versus the condition we have. So this is why the conceptual framework I've developed 
is connected with various other aspects of my understanding of how we are formed into individuals based on our individual environments and how no two experiences can be the same and therefore we, we are created into different beings on top of the uh, physical, genetic, DNA, whatever aspects that help to form us into individuals as well that have an imposition. There might even be uh, planetary frequency impositions and so-called astrology, which I don't view as 100%, especially with my revision of, of uh, the source of symbols and how they reflected nature and the real wheel of the zodiac and how that changes when in comparison to the, the false form, which was probably adopted through Babylon and it was corrupted and changed, as I'll demonstrate in my future work. So astrology, I used to believe it was possible. Now I'm not so sure, but it's still a possibility. So there's planetary uh, vibrations and frequencies that can affect us because we're all born at certain moments in specific position. We're not born at the same position. We're not born at the same time. Nowhere. No, nothing in the universe can occupy the same space at the same time. That is a law. Therefore, there's all frequencies going around us. We know that. Look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, planets create frequencies in their orbits. Uh, they can, the Venus and, and Earth orbit creates um, um, a five-pointed, yeah, it's a five-pointed uh, looping, so you can look at it as a pentagram. And this happens in the solar system, so you can see as they, they generate frequencies. Anyways, everything has a frequency. The Earth has a seven hertz frequency, I believe, which is the same as our body. Everything has frequencies, so who knows? Maybe there's planetary impositions and frequencies that impose us with certain um, personality characteristics on top of the reinforcements, positive or negative, from our parents, from society, that condition us to be who we are. So the planetary impositions are conditions as well, and we can become whoever the hell we want to be. At the root, we are all the same. Without all these impositions, well, we're all just human nature, which is the true self, higher self, higher will. And what is the soul and the spirit that all the, the past uh, conceptions and religions have, have conceived of wasn't an individual because we're only the individual here. That's just an, um, sorry, it's not an individual identity. It is an individuation, just like everything in, in the universe and conceptually comes from an, uh, an aspect of individuation of the all one consciousness where it divides and it um, creates the the field, the quantum field, and then that produces subatomic particles and then greater complexity. This is why I also view the 11 dimensions as they are lower and we're above and we're, we're at the forefront of evolution because all the other ones, they came before and they were at the beginning and they're, they're lower than us in terms of evolution. So all these other entities and people think, oh, we got to ascend and all this stuff. No, you're looking at it wrong. Those guys are in the lower dimension. The, the, where we are here in the physical, this is where it's at. This is the reason we're here. This is the evolution. The evolution isn't the, the seven hidden dimensions that came before. No, that's what produced where we are. It's Look at this in, in an order of development. <laughs> we're not supposed to go back to, to non-corporeal entities. Because there's already those there that, that are lower than us. And they're, they're corrupted. So there's many different realms or whatever possibilities that I can't verify. So they're just pure belief as far as I'm concerned and speculation and conceptions. And they can possibly help to um, join into our models. But where we are is where we are. And we're not there. So why focus on where you're not and where you're not supposed to be? Because you're here on the ground to do work on the ground. So stop getting lost in the clouds. So there might be a, an, a point of uh, ascension into another species in another million years, or if we evolve consciousness fast enough, it'll happen sooner or whatever into non-energy beings. I don't know. That's just speculation. You have it in uh, Stargate SG-1, and you have it in the movie um, Lucy. So, you know, oh, evolve consciousness and uh, physiologically where you can manipulate matter, and then eventually you'll en evolve into an energy being. Is that possible? Sure. Is that true? No, it's not a proven truth. It's not a known truth. It's not an objective truth. Is it possible? Yes, anything's possible. We could end up flying. That'd be awesome. I don't deny it as a possibility. Is it probable? Uh, no. There's a difference between possible and probable. 
So people really, 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 really need to understand to learn to delineate between objective verifiables and conceptual possibilities. If you want to argue about that the absolute 100% certainty and that it is known that a concept is a known and 100% certainty, well, I just have to laugh because you don't understand how to delineate between objective verifiables and possibilities of a conceptual nature. So, yeah. Well, that was a just summary on my concept of how we are who we are and how we're all the same because we're all the same at a higher at a higher level than source and um, that we can embody and become the transcendental being. We can't become it fully, but we can aspects of it. Truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law. And if you look at oh yeah, right. So I was saying the the quantum field and then the subatomic particles and everything that built up well, you have the lower level where we don't live there. So people want to think that the quantum level is, oh, everything's like the quantum, and, it, and they apply blind correspondence and the quantum rules into our reality, and they get lost in pseudo-belief and pseudo-spiritualism, and it's all belief because they don't know how to delineate again ostensible reality that they can verify versus beliefs and possibilities and speculation and concepts. People are lost in their minds. They don't know how to connect to reality. So we are the same. We're all the same. We're only different because we're born at different times in different places. That's it. We all have the same psychology. We have different psychological uh, factors and impositions, but uh, the brain is the brain. The, the way consciousness operates is the same for everybody. Psychology operates the same for everybody. You might have different psychological problems or whatever, but psychology, emotions, thought, action, it's all the same. Because it's the same um, consciousness source. So when you look at the origin of consciousness, uh, sorry, the, the, the base level of reality, you can look at that as, uh, the, quote, all consciousness that then um, forms whatever, the, the field, and then if it's particles and atoms, and molecules, and etc., into greater complexity, and eventually it arrives at greater complexity that's able, rather than just being a physical thing, the the the, the body vehicle of matter has developed to a great enough complexity in order to express consciousness and express free will, and that's where we're at. But it was all. This is another theory I have. It was all waiting. It just needed the consciousness was is all so in a theory consciousness is all in everything in the universe and it just needs a body vehicle to express and become a proper expression of consciousness in order to actualize transcendental aspects of being, which is where uh, human beings are as our human nature as a true human being in our human nature, not as our human condition. So that's what a true human being is, as a reflection of human nature and not human condition. And other animals have a lesser capacity. Although they can actualize some aspects, they have care, and they can care for other species. Uh, you have different animals playing with different uh, different kinds of animals. You know we're all part of the same genus. You, know, they, you have predators playing... Uh, even with their, their quote, uh, their programmed and conditioned prey, according to uh, the base uh, laws, boundaries, and limits of their programming for their body survival, their consciousness has been able to identify with others that they would normally be programmed to um, murder and kill to eat, because they are animals live amorally. But some of them can develop inklings of morality, even though they don't understand morality, they don't understand what they're doing, they have a care, because they do have thought, emotion, and action. So they, not as much as us, but they can develop it in some capacity, and express it, and they, they play with other animals that are supposed to be their prey, or that they could eat, or whatever, and uh, so we all have the capacity for joy, and caring, and emotion, and, and sharing a connection, and relating to each other as animals, because we're higher order complexity where consciousness has been able to manifest in a body vehicle 
that can express itself as free will to do what it wants and the, the modalities of consciousness in varying degrees. Whereas plants can't and you have rocks that can't and everything else that can't and uh, subatomic particles that can't and you know everything else can't and that's why you go from the seven dimensions up and then you build up in greater complexity and greater ability to manifest the transcendental aspects of being. So, um, that is the substance we all are. We are animal life forms, um, sharing blood and bodies like others of our kind, natural predisposition, innate form, uh, the sort and rank of life we are, animals, from the common kind of birth and origin, where we are born into the world with thoughts and feelings and an awareness of the surrounding reality because we are all animals. That is the substance we all are. We are animals of blood, bone, muscle, etc. We think and feel. We are of the same kind, with a great degree of variation in this universal genus, but this is our greater family. In terms of physicality, our greater family extends to all animals. We all have thoughts, emotions, and actions, and we all have free will. A tangent side note is related to king, as I mentioned in the etymology above. In Old English, king was kining, which is kin, and uh, the end ing, ing. Again, we can see the relation of kin, kind, and family, and how it is used to manipulate our understanding of reality and our relative position in it. The king is our kin, our kind. He is our family, our quote, family leader. That's where the, the origin of king comes from as I see it. Just like a family household head, the quote father, figure who takes quote care of their quote family and watches over them, protects them, guards them. At least that is the illusory narrative they fabricate for us through their creation of stories, historical or not. And you can see how this relates to my previous article on bearing good and evil. No, no, sorry. On family ownership and sla family slavery and ownership, where family is um, originally a word in famulus, and it meant servant or slave, even though people want to contest that because they're so attached to the word family and how it relates to a good thing, they don't want to objectively look at reality and see how words actually developed, family. So kin is related to family just because of our current connotation of family and how we currently understand the word family, not as it was originally derived and meant, but we understand kin and kind through family because that's how we associate kin and kind as a family because we connect to them. But originally it was not such a good word. It was meant to deceptively bring people as slaves and servants into quote family so that they would become part of the household with the households onto as ownership and then they would feel included. And this is where I also talked about uh, the house slave and how, how people uh, once you once you're brought into a collective where you feel identified with them and you connect with them, you're going to dissociate with those lower, the other slaves, and you're going to be a house slave, and you're going to be happy that instead of serving everyone, now you you serve others, but you also have others serving you. So you've gone up the rank in the predator dominator psychopathic system that we live in, the enslavement system we live in, the hierarchical enslavement system of order following we all are a part of. We're all order followers from birth. We get imposed with certain conditions and we follow the orders. We don't recreate ourselves into an image we want. We're limited by that because if we would try to remove everything that we were imposed with, we would end up with a blank slate. So you've you got to keep some aspects of identity that you were uh, conditioned with, as it's who you have become in this physicality form. So if we were all to remove that, well, we'd all just be um, expressions of truth, love, good, right, morality. And we wouldn't even have, you know, distinct personalities, you could say, if we wiped out our personalities. So that's why the, the king is another manipulation on kin and kind through family, where you think your, your, your king is your, your kin and your kind, and, oh, he's allowed to rule over us and take care of us because he's the father figure, right, and the family and protects and guards us. So if you want to look at that again, go look at the family um, slavery and ownership article. You'll understand more. 
they don't, quote, watch over us in true guardianship and care. No, they, quote, watch over us to make sure we stay under their thumb, enslaved and controlled, through a false proxy euphemism, obfuscation, mind control, casting a spell on our minds, selling us the belief that they, quote, care for our well-being. This is what our leaders do. And we buy into it, because we buy into this whole, this whole magical spell, mind control bullshit of our way of living. Because we're not thinking for ourselves and figuring it out for what it is, seeing it for what it is. The king is responsible for us. We don't need to be, and daddy will take care of us. It's the same thing as when we're a child. And we have these leaders who do things for us. That's what government is. It's all an abdication of personal responsibility. The only time you can do that is when you're a child and you're not able to be responsible. But at a certain age, you have to grow up. And we don't want to grow up as a, as a species, as a civilization. It's always about, oh, we've got to have centralization. We've got to, have, we've got to follow the central authority, the authority of enslavement. We're, we're really stupid. As smart as we are, we're damn stupid as humans. We can be so much more. The infinite potential and value that we can aspire to as a, an aspect of the transcendental being of truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, true self, higher self, higher will, of that one force, aspects of the one force, and not a, a separate identity, personality of a, a soul or spirit above, in between you and the one you can embody. It's about becoming more of that aspects of that one force. Truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, the transcendental being. And that's when we develop responsibility and, and shake off the conditioning we've been imposed into uh, false falsity and false ways of living. We can actualize more of the transcendental aspects of being. The aspects of transcendental being. That's being with a capital B. You see, it's one thing. Transcendental being is the capital B, being, and we are the small b, being. There's no need for an intermediary. It's just another concept. And my concept doesn't need that concept of the intermediary. I do not need it in my concept of reality, um, how I understand myself and how we are all created, and how we are all uh, different, and how we are all separate identities. I don't need that. The middle point doesn't make any sense to me at all. Until I can see some evidence grounded in reality, like the transcendental being, which is a one thing, which I can see in reality as a manifestation through us as little beings. That's why there's a big being, and there's a little being, and there's not a middle being. Because we're manifesting aspects of transcendental being with a big B. Truth, love, good, right, morality, natural law, which is... The true self, higher self, higher will, which is God, source, spirit, all, singularity, etc. That's what we're supposed to become as true human beings, and our human nature is that higher nature, the higher consciousness. There's no need for an intermediary. It doesn't make any sense. I used to accept it as a possibility, because that's what the popular um, so-called spiritual conceptions were, and uh, it was popularized, you know, for thousands of years. That's what everyone's believing in. So it's just the, the natural um, convention and conditioning we get fed as impositions uh, for beliefs. And that's what all the rel religiosity is uh, is around. They all believe that. But when you when I started to think of it myself, and I started to empty my cup and let go of unlearn what I learned, and I reformulated all my understanding. Well, this is the understanding I've come to myself, my conception. You want to believe your own conception? Fine. I have reevaluated everything and this is what I come to. So we can see transcendental aspects of being, that one being, manifested through us as we manifest good, as we manifest love, as we manifest truth. They don't exist in themselves. They can only exist through a manifestation of smaller beings. The bigger being is manifested through smaller being. It's not the bigger being is manifested through a middle being, and then the middle being goes through the smaller being. Where is the proof for that? There's no evidence of that. Even conceptually, there's no need for it. It's all in an attachment to a belief. Anyway, like I said, I can be wrong. It's a concept. It's a model. When I've reconstructed my model, there's always that possibility of the, the popularized notion. But when I reconstructed my model and how I understand the ego, personality, identity construct, 
and how we're all the same. Now we're all the same psychology, the same consciousness, thoughts, emotions, and actions, all the same. We manifest them differently because we have different ego personality identity constructs, which create different people. So that means we're not going to be the same, which is why we have an identity here, which is why we don't have an identity above. Because the identity is here, created in the physical. And other realms, well, they have their realms. We have our realm where we're created in the physical here in our realm. And other entities, the, the, the channeled jinns and archons and the demons or whatever, well, they have their own reality. They don't live here. And maybe they can, so they can, um, try to take over our bodies or whatever in this, this alleged, uh, uh, aspect of reality that I can't confirm. And you have, uh, you know, there's people who ask entities to come in. And then there's people who um, are invaded with entities. So yes, I do believe there are entities because the stories are there. But you know, have I been in, <laughs> taken over by an entity? No. So I can't experientially say that it's it's true. But I do believe with a strong de degree of uh, of, of uh, correspondence between the various accounts over time that yes, there is this aspect of other entities, but they're disembodied and they're lower than us. And that's why they try to take over bodies, because we are higher than them. So, seven lower dimensions, upper four dimensions. We live in the 4D. Time plus 3D space. If you don't have time, all you have is space, and that's nothing. That's entropy. That's stagnation and frozen. When everything's frozen, there's no time. And that's entropy and stagnation, in one sense of view. There's also the entropy where everything is doesn't exist, and everything's evenly dispersed. And that's symmetry order. And you have our complexity of the, of the universe where we have grouping order. So things start from the symmetry order of the implicate, which is the field, and then they grow in complexity from the implicate order of, of symmetry grouping, which is just everything evenly dispersed and everywhere, which is entropy and nothing, stagnation, frozen. And then it develops into syntropy and uh, movement and activity of uh, the particles and things and the greatest, and then they coalesce and um, greater systems, um, greater holes are formed from parts that create emergent properties that develop into greater complexity and allow more things to happen and then it grows and grows and grows and that's why we're at the forefront. Not the lower levels, not the unseen dimensions, they're not above us, we're above. Because people have this misconception that you, know, you can look at all spirits higher and matters lower yeah, but that's just one conceptual model. You can't always take things in one model and correspond them blindly across. So yeah, in a sense, matter's lower, it's denser, it's at a lower vibratory rate, and the the quote uh, spiritual is things that are unseen. So you have, you know, the ultraviolet uh, spectrum and higher frequencies that oscillate faster and faster and faster that we can't see, and uh, maybe. Uh, other entities exist in those higher frequency rates of vibrations. I don't know. But to assume that that means that they're at a higher position in evolution of the, the 11 dimensions or of what the, the all consciousness wants or wills or whatever, well, that's just belief. And I suspect it's possibly what they want us to believe, that they are at a higher plane and that that's what we're supposed to go in some form of ascension to be like them, which is a complete reversal of direction. You do not want to be like those beings. Read Richard Wetherill's book. And his concept's pretty interesting. So, when relating care to kind, we come to family and therefore ownership. And I have a link to that article. Family, ownership, and slavery. Family was first a negative and became positive as well, just as we see with the definition of care and like compassion and suffering, where we can also have positive and negative understandings to apply this suffering in a good way, we can also do the same with care of sorrow and grief to understand how it can be seen as the positive it became, which is what I explained earlier. The negative association of care can be linked to the positive aspects of care that developed. The negative would be sorrow, anxiety, grief, burden, lament, trouble, and then it starts to shift over into the dual meaning more clearly with worry, concern, responsibility, maintenance, upkeep, and even more to the positive with charge, oversight, protection, taking those in need and fondness for. 
and then you become kind towards them because you have a fondness and you know, oversight protection, etc. So we become kind to animals rather than paying other people to murder them so that we can eat dead corpses, cadavers, carcasses, and dead bodies. Yeah, that's awesome, eh? Think about eating dead bodies. We're, we're so demented and twisted. The predatory, dominator, psychopathic way of living in falsity, in contradiction, antithetical to human being a real human being as our human nature, which is the true self, higher self, higher will. Aspects of the transcendental being, big B, as we are the small B being. So in care we can have sorrow, grief, uh, sorrow, anxiety, grief, burden, lament, trouble, worry, concern. Why? For what? Usually something bad or evil happens. A generation of evil takes place. An evil process, behavior force, culminates in the resulting manifestation, a generated action, of evil. From this injustice, from this evil, we feel it. As I was saying earlier, we need to feel reality. It creates a burden, worry, and concern in us. From that burden, worry, or concern can come the true care to generate our experience and reality in the way and path it should be, rather than the way and path it currently is in evil. So if you don't feel reality, you're not going to feel the evil, and you're not going to have a generation of your care capacity in your, quote, heart, which is just your consciousness, because the inner aspects of consciousness are, quote, mind and, quote, heart. I've written about this in uh, Mind and Heart, Left and Right Brain. You can check that article there. Um, so these are just aspects of consciousness. This is where the responsibility needs to be developed. Now we can see how this concern, worry, and burden turns into a care for others in the sense we are used to, a kindness of doing good. So you see how our care brings us to aspects, to greater aspects of the transcendental being. Truth, love, good. You develop care by feeling the negatives in reality, by expanding your identification and connection. So instead of just yourself, or just your family, or just your tribe, or your race, or your nation, or humans, well, you get to the animals, and you stop creating evil against the animals. People don't want to face that, because they don't have developed care, because they're not in greater actualization of... Um, the true nature, human nature, of a, being a real human being, connected to your aspects of consciousness known as, quote, heart and care. So you're not going to generate in true care for truth and morality and other beings. It's going to be all about you, which is Satanism. It's about my survival, my truth, and my freedom. There's different levels of Satanism. There's different... There's a... Uh, reduction in degrees of Satanism, but it's still Satanism. When you only focus on humans and you don't care about the animals, well, you are still a Satanist. I'm still a Satanist in some degrees. You know, in terms of understanding my truth, my freedom, my survival. Yes, I do speak for the animals who don't have a voice, but, you know, I'm sure I still have some aspects of, uh, the need developing. For sure, until I die. And that's what we all do when we're born. We don't have knowledge from somewhere else. And You're born and you learn. You start learning. And if you don't want to learn, guess what? You're going to die ignorant because you don't have knowledge coming from a true self. You don't have knowledge from, from coming from somewhere else feeding into you. You have to learn. You have to do the work. It's not the higher self is going to, Oh, look at that. I'm connected to the higher self. It's feeding me information like some people want to believe these New Agers. No. Everything you learn is you learning it. And if you don't want to learn, guess what? You're going to end up like like my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, and everyone else around me who doesn't learn. And guess what? You're not going to become the true nature, the true self, the, the human nature, and a human being, a real human being. Why? Because you don't care to learn. You have some innate capacities of, yeah, they care, but they're they're... They're blinded by how limited their care is, and they don't seek truth and morality to discover how limited their care is. So they, they believe in the positivity mask, the optimism bias of everything's fine the way it is, and they'll just keep going on the way it is, and they don't need to learn, because you actually do need to learn, because you do all the work. Because again, it's not an individual higher self-consciousness 
uh, personal identity that's like, oh, well, I know this, and uh, once you get developed enough, I'm going to feed you information. No. Look at how developed I am. Look at all the information I've accumulated. You think this comes from some freaking higher self? No. That's anthropomorphiz anthropomorphization of identity. God doesn't give us information. We have to discover it by recognizing aspects of the transcendental being. Truth, love, good, right, morality, higher self, uh, higher will, God, source, spirit, all one. It's different, uh, different aspects of one force. Of a higher, 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 much higher nature. So if you want to look at it, you know, everything is different aspects of that one force. As I mentioned before in the theory and conception that, you know, the all consciousness creates everything. So it goes from the higher plane and it goes down to the lower plane where it divides into a field and then it builds back up. I don't know. These are just concepts and ideas. So this is where the responsibility needs to be developed. Now we can see how this concern, worry, and burden turns into care for others in the sense we are used to. Kind, kindness of doing good. Because the good is the transcendental being. It's the higher nature. It's expressed through us, through the lower nature, that's trying to be aspects of the higher nature. You can be just a human animal, or you can become successively greater degrees of the human being. Because you care for truth and morality and other beings and you're trying to better yourself. Always and always and always. You're learning always and always and always. You're not just sitting back and receiving information from uh, another source. Which can be done, as I said, with entities. But the entities are not the higher self. So again, people can be getting confused with this aspect of other dimensional beings and entities. And how they can channel information. And you want to transpose that to a higher self concept and how that's the same as these other entities which it is not at all and you want to say oh they, they can give it the higher self can give me information too that's my higher self giving me information and you have your own higher self well no the higher self is God conceptually that's the higher will God's will is the will of creation the will of the creator the will of nature which is Nature level 2, not nature level 1, which I'll get into in my natural law presentation. It's not the physical nature of uh, green and whatever on the planet. It's a higher nature. The law, the laws, the, the will of nature in that sense. Um, anyways, so the kindness of doing good. When we feel for others, we connect with them as our kind, our race, our class, our family. This can have us develop the greater responsibility. So we understand, oh my God, now I identified with uh, the animals as I'm supposed to, as my, my kin. And I realize that I'm perpetuating great amounts of horrendous evil, worse than the Nazis. Worse than any human group has done to any other human group. And it's been going on for longer than any human group has been doing harm to other human group, or humans have been doing harm to other humans, because it started with humans... Human animals doing harm to non-human animals. We can then care for other beings and be concerned, worried, and burdened with their conditions and seek to maintain and upkeep their well-being, not their ill-being, not their harm. To do good to them, to be kind to them, because they are our own kind, begotten and born of the same kind, class, genera, and universal as we are. Although care may be uh, may seem to be a negative, with sorrow, grief, anxiety, etc., those are the negative feelings again that we must listen to, bearing it, bearing good and evil, in order to drive us in the right direction. We need to feel reality, feel the guilt, feel the shame, feel the judgment we put upon ourselves through the actions and behaviors we choose to engage in. We have free will. We reap what we sow ourselves. Once we start to feel reality as it truly is and see it for what it is, then we can change. We have to pay attention to ourselves and reality to discern, decode, and deocult the reality we live in. 
ignoring our actions and behaviors and the harm they produce does not evolve consciousness. To further evolve consciousness and to further develop the heart center, care, compassion, empathy, conscience, and morality, to be kind, we need to develop our identification, association, and connectedness with others of our kind, others in our global family. We need to stop harming other beings, yes, all animal beings, as much as we can, because we can, because it's wrong, wholesale. And this is about ending evil and slavery wholesale. You've got to go to the bottom root, causal core, foundational level, the moral baseline. They are innocent and have done us no harm, and they have the right to life and freedom just as we do to be free from the harm we would impose upon them for our delusional beliefs in taste and flesh for survival. Because it's all about Satanism. My survival and my freedom, and then my truth, whatever I want to be the truth, will support my survival and my freedom because it's all selfish desires and care. It's not true care for truth, morality, and other beings. So truth is love, care for truth, embrace truth, live truth, integrate with truth and morality, live integrated and connected. Truth is one way, go all the way, make the connection, go vegan. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for your time and attention as well. Have a nice day, take care, peace.